All right, everyone, welcome to another episode of The Liam McCollum Show. Today, I have a great guest on. It's Benjamin Ablo. He is the author of How the West Brought War to Ukraine. Um, I was actually recommended to read this book by a friend of the show, Gene Epstein, who I've had on before, and he sent me an email with his review of the book um, a while ago, and I just wanted to read that really quick. It says, uh, I picked up this essay-length book, less than 20,000 words, partly because I knew I'd get through it quickly, and also because it has blurb endorsements from John Mearsheimer and Douglas McGregor. I expected it to be informative, but was pleasantly surprised by the brilliance and clarity of the writing and the cogency of its logical arguments. And I think I couldn't have said it better than that, so I just wanted to read his review. But uh, I really appreciate you, Benjamin, uh, for coming on the show and working with my schedule. There was some uh, work schedule difficulties, and I'm, I'm happy to happy that you were patient with me. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me. Yeah, well, just uh, to get into this book, I'm wondering what motivated you uh, to write this book, if there was ever like a, a news item or a moment during this war where you realized that this book needed to be written. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I mean, in a way, my answer is kind of funny in that I never decided to write a book. <laughs> Um, what actually happened was I started off writing an op-ed and then the op-ed became too long and I, and I kept trying to squeeze it down. And then I tried to figure out whether certain publications would accept like unusually long op-eds, like a double size op-ed or something. And then I just said, oh, forget it. And I turned it into an essay on medium.com. And I basically wrote the whole thing as a long essay on medium and revised it a few times. And then at a certain point I said, wait a minute, why don't I just turn this into a book? So that, that's, that was sort of what I was laughing at. I mean, I hadn't thought of it this way, but I actually never decided to write a book. And by the time I decided to turn it into a book, it was already written. Um, I mean, of course, I, I ended up revising it uh, you know, a few times after I decided to do it as a book. But maybe to answer your question a little less flipply, um, it, and in terms of why I decided to write an op-ed in the first place and then turn it into a Medium article, I would say... Uh, you know, I worked on nuclear arms issues years ago, I mean, decades ago, uh, and then I kind of diverged. I worked in, I kind of educated myself, and then I worked in Washington, D.C. for a couple of years doing lecturing, writing, and lobbying, uh, and some debating also. Um, but then I really went off into a different path. I, I returned to school. My undergraduate degree was in European history, uh, but I returned to school. I took pre-med courses. I went to medical school. I, I found I didn't really want to practice medicine, but I was quite interested in medicine as an academic subject. And I ended up writing a couple of textbooks. Uh, and it was really only with the kind of the start of the Ukraine war that I really started focusing on these kinds of issues again for the first time in decades. And I, although I had not kept up with, you know, many of the details that were evolving in Ukraine, I had a very strong foundation in questions of uh, you know, nuclear arms control in terms of bilateral U.S.-Soviet relationship. When I was doing it, it was the Soviets. And I'll probably slip a few times during this talk and say Soviets instead of Russians, but just because that was the context I I initially kind of got my feet wet in this stuff. Uh, so uh, I had a, a foundation and I very quickly saw what was happening. And um, I had I knew enough to piece it together for myself. And I really just started wanting to communicate my understanding of what was going on. And at the same time, I was educating myself uh, or re-educating myself, I would say, and also educating myself in some of the specifics of this situation. And I still consider myself uh, kind of a learner. Uh, I mean, I guess everyone is. Anyone who's uh, a serious student or scholar of anything is going to be a perpetual learner. And I certainly feel that way. There's, there's so many aspects to this subject uh, that, um, you know, you need to keep studying and I'm trying to, uh, continue to educate myself, but I felt I knew enough to write a very solid book and I was ready to communicate it. And, um, anyway, uh, hopefully that answers what you were aiming for there. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I kind of wanted to give you the opportunity to, um, give like the pre pretext for the book, um, what the main premise is and, and what the thesis is. Um, wh what prompted you to write this? What's your main argument? Um, and yeah, I'll just let you take that wherever you want. Yeah, well, sure. I mean, uh, let's see if I'm not sure my camera will capture this. Uh, oh, it looks backwards. 
Well, anyway, um, the title is How the West Brought War to Ukraine. And I was using brought war in a somewhat literary sense. It uh, could be interpreted in different ways. But what I meant to imply with that title was that the West had actually, in some sense, caused the war. Obviously, they, it, the West had not caused the war in the immediate proximal sense. Uh, Vladimir Putin made the decision. He and his military strategists and the inner sanctum of the Kremlin made the decision to go to war. But uh, I'm arguing that if you step back from the immediate situation and you look at the deeper causes, that those really ultimately uh, reside in the actions of the West. And the subtitle of the book is Understanding How U.S. and NATO Policies Led to Crisis, War, and the Risk of Nuclear Catastrophe. So I, I think that subtitle really captures the thesis. I look at the actions of the U.S. and NATO. Uh, U.S. is, of course, the major player in NATO and the major influence in NATO. But NATO is important, and the U.S. has European allies. And they also have acted to some extent independently, but oftentimes kind of under the thumb of the U.S., you could say. Um, so I certainly pay the most attention and subject the U.S., the United States, for the most uh, for the heaviest criticism. Uh, but I don't, uh, you know, exonerate the European leaders who, at the very minimum, I would say, uh, were, uh, you know, lapdogs in many cases. Um, uh, and then neither do I aim to exonerate Vladimir Putin. I, I, I say this. I don't spend a lot of time focusing on it because everyone and, and everyone is, you know, uh, beating up on Vladimir Putin. Uh, I, I didn't feel I didn't I didn't need to spend my time discussing the ways in which he was culpable. But I do say in passing at the beginning that I believe he had alternatives to war uh, and that, you know, I don't go into this, but I, he should have acted on them. I mean, anytime you launch a war, even if there are what are considered in terms of international policy and foreign affairs and political science, a quote unquote legitimate reason to go to war or at the very minimum legitimate uh, concerns about international about one's uh, about a nation's security uh, as a nation. Um, to go to war means you are killing a lot of people, uh, a lot of innocents, uh, even the soldiers on the other side and your own soldiers are, you know, I've said this before in other settings, but ultimately everyone is a civilian. I mean, it just so happens that some of them end up serving in the military. Uh, you know, you're talking about uh, 18, 19, 20 year old young men, boys in some respect who are being, you know, killed, burned alive in their tanks with, with, um, uh, with javelin and other anti-tank weapons. Uh, and then, of course, you're dealing with, quote unquote, collateral damage. You know, people who are just outright civilians, in many cases, you know, minors, women, uh, men who are not wanting to serve are being, you know, killed or being sucked into the army or being uh, impressed into the army. So uh, anytime you launch a war, even if one can argue for a theoretical justification for it, uh, I, I think it's incumbent on the leader to really do everything possible, even to the point of embarrassment of oneself, to try to avoid that war. And uh, I don't feel, I mean, I'm, this is a, a detailed area and I'd like to study it more, but uh, everything I know suggests to me that Vladimir Putin did not do everything possible to avoid the war. Perhaps he should have uh, cut off um, uh, Nord Stream 1 pipeline before the, the war started as a way to try to signal his, the seriousness of his intent. Uh, he probably should have been more outspoken in international settings. Now, whether that would have achieved anything, I mean, the U.S. in many respects has been exceptionally intransigent, uh, is very difficult to know. But uh, again, when you're dealing with uh, human lives, especially many human lives, you have a responsibility to take very serious actions. Uh, so that's that's in some way my caveat, uh, not just because I don't want to be accused of you know, being uh, completely one-sided, which I don't feel that I am. Uh, but uh, I do believe that in terms of if one had to pick, you know, really the most culpable party, taking both the immediate causes and the distal causes into effect, I would say that the West, uh, and in particular U.S., is most responsible. I think the U.S. could have done a lot at many stages to avoid this war, um, just as Vladimir Putin could have done a lot uh, at the later, at the very end stages. Yeah, one of my favorite arguments, I, and I think one of your stronger arguments in the book, frames all of this in the in the context of the nuclear risk. And it, it essentially, if I can kind of sum it up here, is that 
Um, if the Western narrative is correct, perhaps we can say that the nuclear risk that we are currently presented with is worth it. But you're going throughout this book to to demonstrate that actually the Western narrative is wrong and therefore the nuclear risk is not worth it. Um, So to kind of go from there, can you present how you think or can you present the Western narrative as it is and then um, try to phrase that maybe in the most charitable way. What do you think the current Western narrative is? Yeah, sure. I'll be glad to do that. Uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to just, before I do that, though, I'd like to just step back and uh, mention one point, which is kind of helps frame this in a way I'd like. The uh, the introduction of the book, I, I, the book begins with an overview. It's just a page and a half. It, it's almost like you'd expect like an abstract in an academic article where I just summarize what's my thesis so that somebody who's trying to decide whether to pick up this book and wants something a little more than the one paragraph, one paragraph blurb on the back can understand that. And that's my little overview. But then I have a fairly substantial introduction. I mean, it's a short book, so substantial means eight pages or something. Uh, and the reason why I mention this is I call that introduction colon, and then the the uh, sort of the sub theme of the you know the the next line the byline whatever you want to call it is how the narrative drives the war. And my point there is that when you uh, frame uh, a series of events in a certain way that will lead to certain conclusions. So if you have a, a particular understanding of the past or a particular understanding of the present, the narrative, that can lead naturally to certain conclusions and certain policy decisions for the future. Uh, and if you have a different narrative and a different set of policy conclusions, a different narrative and different uh, about the present and about the past, that will likely lead to a different set of policy outcomes. Uh, so so the narrative drives the war. So in some sense, what you're asking is, what is the mainstream the mainstream narrative, is how I might put it. <clears throat> uh, the mainstream narrative, I think, can be summed up. Uh, you know, as a matter of fact, I'm going to just read the, the back paragraph of the book. The uh, This is the blurb on the back on the back cover. According to the Western narrative, Vladimir Putin is an insatiable Hitler-like expansionist who invaded Ukraine as an unprovoked land grab. That story is incorrect. In reality, the United States and NATO bear significant responsibility. Through a series of misguided policies, Washington and its European allies placed Russia in an untenable situation for which war seemed to Mr. Putin and his military staff the only workable solution. This brief book lays out the relevant history and explains how the West needlessly created conflict and now labors under an existential threat of its own making. Now, to expand on that just a little bit more uh, and to focus even more directly on your question, uh, I refer to the w- mainstream Western narrative as as uh, taking Putin as a Hitler-like character who is an ex- expansionist, uh, intrinsically expansionist. He's not responding in any way to external actions or exogenous actions by the U.S. or by NATO. Uh, he's not responding to what might be considered legitimate national security uh, concerns on the part of Russia. Um, you know, if you think of the traditional image of World War II of Hitler, you know, it's this uh, hunt for Lebensraum, living space. Um, and, and there are there are nuances to this story that, uh, you, you know, that uh, I'm not going to try to go into. But um uh, that's the basic story. And that w- when you're dealing with someone who's a, basically a paranoid, expansionist, uh, Hitler-like character who's not responding to external threats, but is responding purely to an internal drive to expand, then the whole question is, if you're going to negotiate with that person, you may be setting yourself up for appeasement. Um, you're and so the, the the conventional narrative frames Putin and Russian actions in a way that sets up negotiations as being like a Munich style appeasement when Chamberlain, uh, you know, ostensibly appeased Hitler and, you know, laid the groundwork for a further expansion. Um, so I would say that this is the mainstream narrative that Hitler, uh, Hitler, that Putin is, even if it's sometimes he's actually referred to as a Hitler-like character uh, or even the new Hitler, other times it's not, but the essence of the character is the same. So the mainstream narrative, I think, has 
Putin as a sort of Hitler-like intrinsically expansionist person, whether he's trying to expand for uh, uh, you know one set of reasons or whether he's trying to expand for sort of you know evoking the old uh, Russian imperial uh, uh, empire. Uh, uh, intrinsic innate expansionism and it sort of follows from that that you will that an attempt to negotiate with that you may be setting yourself up you don't necessarily have to be but you may be setting yourself up for an appeasement like situation where you're just enabling the, that uh, person or that regime uh, and what I argue is that that is a uh, an incorrect narrative um, I think you can make a case that even if that narrative were correct Unless the person is is deeply, deeply irrational, they have certain shared interests for survival. Um, uh, so negotiation still remains possible. It doesn't have to be a totally negative uh, appeasement. You can still have sort of a um, a non-zero sum uh, negotiation. I think, but the basic essence is still, I think, that the more the person is intrinsically expansionist, the more likely a um, uh, negotiation is to become sort of an appeasement. But if you can uh, show arguably, plausibly, or even strongly that that narrative is incorrect and that much of the actions that have been taken by Russia and by Mr. Putin have been, uh, uh, I was going to say defensive, and I think in some sense you could frame it that way, um, I uh, you know, sometimes prefer to put it that it was a violent and destructive response to misguided Western actions. That is, the, the actions that were taken, even if they were defensive, were violent and destructive. Uh, there's no question about that. A lot of innocents have lost their lives. A lot of soldiers on both sides have lost their lives uh, and been, you know, maimed, wounded, traumatized, etc. cetera. Um, but uh, anyway, I think, I think I've, I've captured what I'm trying to say. Uh, did, did I capture the, you know, is that uh, anything you want me to add to that, uh, Liam? No, I, th I think you ans answered it well. Um, and, and the next question I just have is uh, to make that case about why the Western narrative is wrong. Um, I think a lot of us on, on this side who have been arguing that uh, that Russia is definitely, you know, in the wrong here when it comes to war, but that isn't to say that they weren't um, provoked. A lot of us have been pointing to the fact that NATO uh, is largely responsible to the for this. And I think almost as a shorthand, we've been saying NATO expansion led Putin to uh, invade Ukraine. But your book almost sets out to clarify and correct and make our argument better and says, well, actually, that picture isn't the full picture. Yes, NATO is responsible, but there's a lot more to it. Um, so can, can you kind of begin to make that case starting with the 1990s and leading up to 2014? Sure, sure. Um, and I think that's a, a nice way of putting it. And I'll also say there are others who have made the similar case. They've said, yes, NATO is important. And I say, yes, NATO expansion is important, but it's not the whole story by any means. Um, so I think I would begin the story. Uh, and maybe we can break this into a few pieces. Otherwise, I'll just you know go off on a a long monologue here. Um, I think the the story can productively, I mean, you can start a historical story at any point, uh, 30 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago, a million years ago. But I think uh, maybe the most appropriate and useful place to start this story is with the demise of the Soviet Union, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the end of the Soviet Union, however you want to frame it. Um, and at that time, uh, you know, West uh, Germany was divided into an East and Western portion uh, with Berlin itself, uh, a divided city uh, plopped down in the middle of uh, Eastern uh, Germany. So uh, the uh, United States and NATO wanted to uh, re, uh, reintegrate, uh, to um, uh, reunify Germany, to bring together East and West Germany, and to do so under the uh, supervision and the, uh, I guess you call it aegis, of, uh, of NATO. Now, to do that required that Moscow, uh, then the Soviet Union, of course, that Moscow remove roughly 400,000 troops from East Germany. And that is a major ask of a country. And to do that, uh, the US and uh, uh, the NATO countries and the European allies acting individually, um, and, uh, and in some cases together, 
um, made um, uh, <clears throat> uh, promises a little bit strong, but they uh, they strongly indicated to Moscow that uh, the U.S. would not. And I say it was a little strong because these these things were never instantiated in written treaties. But they were multiple conversations between the U.S. and uh, Soviet leaders, and these were not just conversations, but were also uh, written down in the form of uh, memoranda uh, that uh, are now uh, in the form of documentary evidence. Um, so uh, the U.S. and um, uh, uh, European allies basically gave uh, uh, Moscow a whole set of assurances. I think assurances is a very good word to use for this. It suggests something uh, weaker than a treaty, but stronger than a very casual remark, uh, that if Moscow would remove the 400,000 uh, troops from East Germany and allow the East and West Germany to unify under NATO auspices, uh, that the Western powers would agree not to take advantage of that by expanding NATO uh, uh, east of the Elbe River, um, which basically is saying not expand east of uh, the current line in West Germany. Um, uh, and what actually happened is within a few years it became clear that the uh, Western powers were going to expand. By 1997, it was very clear. And in fact, the first three countries came in in 1999. Uh, and at that time, although this is left out of the uh, Washington narrative currently, and it's left out of the media narrative, very unfortunately, uh, a great many eminent statesmen, military figures, uh, people within the Defense Department, um, uh, stated that this is just asking for a disaster. And uh, George Kennan, who was, you know, in some sense, the dean of uh, diplomatic relations with the Soviet Union at that time, George Kennan had um, formulated the, con the, uh, the concept of um, containment uh, when he was the charge d'affaires of the Moscow, of the embassy in Moscow in the late 40s. Uh, and eventually he became uh, ambassador to the Soviet Union. Um, uh, and Kennan was very outspoken that this is a disaster waiting to happen and strongly advocated against it. Many others did, including uh, many hawks. Um, Paul Nitze, who was the uh, produced basically the founding document of um, NSC 68, which pretty much founded the Cold War within the U.S., uh, was opposed to the expansion. Robert McNamara, who, you know, bombed the hell out of um uh, the Vietnamese, the Cambodians uh, during the Vietnam, Vietnam War was opposed to it. Um, uh, uh, many others, and I, I list them in the book, and I give um, uh, documentation that one could find good citations online. Um, so this was widely recognized that this could be a, a true disaster, uh, but nonetheless, the U.S. pushed ahead with it and uh, basically continued from there. So they had a, um, a group of countries that were brought into NATO in 1999. Another group was brought in in 2004. Um, uh, in 2008, uh, NATO stated that Ukraine and Georgia, both right on Russia's border, uh, would become NATO members. They didn't take immediate action to bring them in. Uh, and there's a complicated history to that itself. Uh, and uh, other countries have been brought brought in right along. At the same time, the U.S. was unilaterally uh, backing out of arms control treaties. So in, I believe it was the end of 2000, I sometimes mix this up, it was either the end of 2001, December 2001, uh, really right before the new year, or may have been 2000, um, 2000 leading into 2001. Uh, uh, the U.S. backed out of the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, which had been in place since 1972 and was a, a crucially important uh, um, uh, break on the arms race. Uh, the U.S. backed out of that unilaterally. And then in, 19, uh, uh, in 2019, um, uh, Donald Trump backed out of the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, which had been in place that had been negotiated under um, Ronald Reagan with Gorbachev in 1987. Another very important uh, landmark arms control treaty. And in both cases, the U.S. backed out unilaterally. Uh, now, there were accusations of Russian cheating in connection with the Intermediate Range Treaty. Uh, 
uh, but there were also Soviet accusations of the U.S. cheating. And in fact, there were plausible arguments on both sides. Uh, and it's very hard to sort that out from afar. But the important point was, is that while the Russians were eager to try to have active negotiations and uh, basically resolve the issues of the questions of cheating on both sides, the U.S. did not want to. Um, and it seemed that they chose not to because they felt they could have a short-term tactical advantage. And I discussed this in the book. I give some very nice quotations from a um, uh, tactical rocket specialist in the U.S. Um, Army, uh, Brendan Devereaux who's written some excellent articles at, at uh, war.com, which is an online military insider website. Um, uh, and actually, Brennan, I was in touch with uh, during the writing of this book because I wanted to be citing his work and I wanted to show him what I was writing and to affirm to myself that the factual material, he doesn't necessarily agree with all my interpretations, but I wanted to make sure the factual material was at a very high level. So I did that. I actually contacted uh, Lockheed Martin uh, of course, they did not respond to my calls, but I did find some of their um, uh, marketing materials online regarding certain uh, anti-ballistic missile systems, and that was quite interesting. Uh, and I quote from some of those, one of those in my book, and I give the uh, uh, the web link to that. So, um, so I think the the problem started with NATO, uh, and NATO expansion has been a key element to this. Um, at the same time, especially since 2014. The uh, Western powers have also been engaged in uh, military involvements, training exercises, arming uh, that's taken place in Ukraine <clears throat> outside of NATO. Uh, these are bilateral arrangements between the U.S. and Ukraine or between other countries in Ukraine or multinational arrangement, multinational training exercises very often that have been uh, directed or supervised by the U.S. Uh, either in Ukraine or near Ukraine. Uh, so, uh, you know, one of the key points I make in, in the book, and then I'll, 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 I'll catch my breath and let you uh, focus things more in a way you might want, uh, is that, uh, and I begin my, uh, actually, I'm going to once again read this. I think it's a simple way to start. Um, uh, in the, I mentioned I have an overview in the book where I try to provide, provide in one page, you know, where are we going to go in this book? Uh, just basically laying out the story that I'll be presenting in the next 60, 70 pages. Um, for almost 200 years, starting with the framing of the Monroe Doctrine in 1823, the United States has, secured, has asserted security claims over virtually the whole Western Hemisphere. Any foreign power that places military forces near U.S. territory knows it is crossing a red line. U.S. policy thus embodies a conviction that where a potential opponent places its forces is crucially important. In fact, this conviction is the cornerstone of American foreign and military policy, and its violation is considered reason for war. Yet when it comes to Russia, the United States and its NATO allies have acted for decades in disregard of this same principle. They have progressively advanced the placement of their military forces toward Russia, even towards its borders. They have done this with inadequate attention to and sometimes blithe disregard for how Russian leaders might perceive this advance. Anyway, that's enough. But the point is that a central theme of the book is that whether this advance of military force towards Russia's border occurred within the context of NATO or outside of NATO, it, in some sense, it doesn't matter. Because what's really significant is the fact that there are concrete, on the ground, military threats uh, that have been advancing towards Russia's border and are now on Russia's border. Um, and that this is the basis, I think, for a strong argument that Russia felt uh, encircled, encroached upon. And this, of course, resonated with a deep history of serious invasion of Russia. Uh, you know, starting with Napoleon, and most more recently in World War One, during World War Two, the uh, Nazi invasion of Russia led to the death of one of every seven persons in Russia. I mean, this is a death toll that's inconceivable to us in the West, um, and this deeply informs uh, Moscow's perceptions of threat. Uh, and these have not been attended to. These kind of concerns have been disregarded and poo-pooed, and you can still find a uh, kind of a blatant disregard of these sorts of uh, legitimate national security concerns in much of the literature that is um, uh, discussing 
you know, the causes for this war and discussing the Russian position and the Russian sets of motivations. Yeah, I, I'd like to zero in on um, the, the Georgian war and the Ukrainian war and really emphasize the threat that, that Russia feels. Um, can, can you maybe just explain the precursors to the Georgian war uh, just really quick, and then we can jump over to Ukraine and what, what exactly happened in 2014? Yeah, sure. And I'll, I'll keep this brief. Um, in 2008, uh, there was a brief war where Russian troops, including you know tanks, etc., where Russian troops uh, went through a pass in a mountain range that separates Georgia and uh, 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 and Russia. Uh, and that is often portrayed as a kind of unprovoked Russian invasion of Georgia and is actually cited as a kind of an early example of the sorts of um, unprovoked uh, expansive militarism uh, that has been shown by Russia. Now, the actual story is much more complicated than that and, in fact, seems to point to uh, an important role for NATO expansion in provoking that action. Uh, it, uh, Georgia exists to the south of Russia. Uh, it's in the Balkans, uh, separated by a mountain range from, from Russia. Uh, there are two uh, semi-autonomous regions inside of Georgia. Uh, one, they're both on the sort of the northern border of Georgia, one of which is like on the uh, far northwest border, and the other is more north central. Uh, the one on the north uh, northwest is called Abkhazia. The one in north central is called uh, South Ossetia. Um, uh, these territories have been contested. They claim to be independent. They've also had uh, fairly long term relationships with with uh, Moscow, uh, but those have uh, the uh, independence or the semi independence of these areas. The autonomy has not been recognized by Georgia. Now, Georgia has also had very close relationships with the United States and with NATO. And in fact, uh, Mikhail uh, Saakashvili, who was then president of uh, Georgia, was basically trained in the U.S. And some would argue that he was kind of put into power by the U.S. Um, and in fact, two weeks before the Russian invasion, quote unquote, of Georgia, the, the U.S. had led a 2,000 man military exercise inside Georgia. Um, a multi multilateral. I can't recall if it was NATO or simply a multilateral. Um, and then two weeks after that, Georgia launched uh, basically a, a minimum 48 hour major assault uh, with rockets and artillery on South Ossetia. And there's many speculations about what caused that. But that was a massive attack. And it was in response to that attack on what Russia perceived to be sort of its ally, uh, and again, keeping in mind, this occurred two weeks after a major U.S. Uh, uh, exercise in uh, Georgia, uh, uh, that uh, Russia then went in and basically cleared out the uh, Georgian forces that had entered into South Ossetia. And they actually penetrated further into Georgia. Uh, and then eventually the whole thing was settled down. This was actually adjudicated, uh, adjudicated is the wrong word, but this was studied by an EU funded independent study that determined that the immediate cause of the problem was the Georgian, unprovoked Georgian attack on South Ossetia uh, involving massive rocket and artillery assaults on populated non-military targets in South Ossetia. So that was the, the beginning point of Georgia. And let me go back one more step and then I'll focus, we can focus on Ukraine, <clears throat> which is that this whole thing took place four months after a major NATO meeting in Bucharest, Romania, uh, which produced this quote unquote Bucharest memorandum, which is at the time that NATO declared that Georgia and South Ossetia, I'm sorry, that Georgia and Ukraine will become NATO members. So this war actually took place right afterward. And one can actually find statements, even by people who are considered very hawkish within the current uh, administrations uh, that basically state that the Georgian, res that the uh, uh, Russian response was ultimately a response to the expansion of NATO. Um, so. So when it comes to 2014, um, it, so there is a lot of speculation about how 
how involved the United States was. And it certainly kind of looks like something akin to an Operation Ajax type operation in in Ukraine. Um, But we probably won't know to the extent that the U.S. was involved probably for decades, but we do know that they were. Um, Can you just go briefly through what we do know, um, especially when it comes to like the Victoria Newland call um, and, and what we can say about U.S. intervention in Ukraine? It looks like you're muted. Thank you. Yes, I said jump up. I want to grab a pen and make a note to myself. Um, uh, yeah, this is a fascinating area. One, something that one can go very deep. I, I, I think one could turn this into a major, indivi- uh, you know, independent project. Just focusing on what was the role of the U.S. involvement in Ukraine. Uh, to what extent can we actually determine that clearly? Um, I will give you uh, my current understanding, and I'll refer people to certain resources if they uh, wish to dig a little bit deeper. Um, uh, I am currently tending to view the situation like this. There, there was a legitimate uprising in uh, in Ukraine, uh, Kiev uh, particularly, but it occurred in other places as well. That was a response to the corruption of the Yanukovych regime. Yanukovych was the uh, in, uh, the uh, the president, uh, yeah, uh, president, not prime minister. Um, uh, from I believe 2010 to 2014, he was democratically elected uh, uh, as judged by international bodies. Uh, he was also corrupt, and he also had, uh, at a minimum, he was even-handed in his relationship with the EU and Russia. Some people describe him as Russia leaning. Um, and uh, there were uh, at that time attempt, uh, uh, negotiations with the European Union to bring Ukraine into the European Union. That was referred to as the "quote unquote" association agreement between Ukraine and the European Union. There were negotiations towards association, um, economic association, and at a certain point, those negotiations broke down. And we can discuss those in more detail if we want. Um, and uh, Ukraine decided to uh, Yanukovych decided to uh, uh, basically throw in his economic lot with Russia, uh, and there were protests uh, to that and also to the corruption. Uh, contrary to popular understanding, though, this did not uh, appear to involve the majority of the population. There were actually polls at that time by the uh, U.S. Agency for International Development that showed that basically uh, the protests involved a mobilized plurality, but that the majority, the actual majority of uh, people within Ukraine uh, preferred to have uh, economic association, uh, probably the majority, a combination of both the EU uh, and um, uh, both with both the EU and with Russia. Um, but that the uh, EU terms of the association agreement prohibited uh, a continuation of the agreement of the uh, terms with Russia. Um, so, uh, any case, that's to sort of set the stage a little bit. So there were legitimate protests, uh, in response to both corruption and in response to anger about the breakdown of the talks, uh, uh or the withdrawal from the talks, uh, with the, uh, w- for association with the European Union. Then what happened, and, and th- that, uh, situation been going on since late 2013, and then the talks actually broke down, I believe, in February, if I'm not mistaken, 2014, and the coup actually took place, uh, you know, later in February in 2014. Um, so uh, what were initially peaceful protests then had elements of violence that were involved and then became uh, much more violent, uh, and then ultimately uh, Ukrainian government buildings were taken over. Uh, by uh, armed military forces on the sides of the protesters. Uh, And many of those were actually apparently fascist. They could be described as Nazis, neo-Nazis. You know, whatever name you want to use for them, they were definitely far-right, ultra-nationalist, and they were armed. Uh, And so I think one way to look at the events there is that there was uh, a legitimate set of protests uh, over conditions in Ukraine that to some extent was superseded and subverted by an armed military coup. Now, the question is, what was the U.S. role in all that is very hard to sort out. The U.S. definitely uh, 
And this was stated by Victoria Newland, who was the Assistant Secretary of State for, um, I believe at that time was for um, uh, European and Eurasian Affairs, if I'm not mistaken. Um, she, in a public statement in 2013, and I give the citation for the YouTube video of this in my book, uh, stated that uh, in previous years, the U.S. had uh, funded, quote unquote, democracy promotion movements within Ukraine to the tune of $5 billion. Uh, then the question is, uh, then there was a phone call. In, so we definitely know that there was uh, an important role of the U.S. in basically uh, helping promote the protests. And the question is, you know, what was the role in the coup? Now, in early in early February 2014, a phone call between Victoria Newland, the same person, the Assistant Secretary of State, uh, and Jeffrey Pyatt. Jeffrey Pyatt was the then ambassador, the U.S. ambassador to Ukraine. So this is a call be between uh, U.S. Assistant Secretary of State and the U.S. ambassador to Ukraine that was intercepted uh, or leaked. Uh, it's not clear by whom. It's most likely that it was intercepted by Russian intelligence, and it was put on uh, YouTube. Uh, and you could hear the whole conversation, and it's uh, you know it's quite explicit. They're actually talking about who it is that they want to take over the government. They refer specifically that they want uh, 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 Yatsenyuk, uh, who actually did become the prime minister, and this was being discussed weeks before the actual coup. So there's a very serious question of whether the U.S. had, you know, not was not just expressing uh, who they would like to have in. They were actually making a decision about who would come in. Um, further, it gets even more complicated in that the Yanukovych government had actually made some bad moves where they were tramping, clamping down on aspects of the, of the uh, uh, aspects of the protest. But when things really went off the rails was what is sometimes referred to as the Maidan massacre. Now, this was an occurrence that occurred really at the culmination of the entire sequence of events. Uh, and what happened was <clears throat> that uh, there was a shooting uh, where uh, close to 100 uh, protesters were killed. And uh, that shooting, which has been referred to as the Maidan Massacre, uh, has long been described in the Western media as a massacre enacted by the police forces of the Yanukovych government. But the most detailed research that's been done on this, and this is done by a Ukrainian-Canadian researcher at the University of Ottawa named Ivan Kachanovsky, and I give the citations in, uh, in the book, uh, but uh, you can also just search the name Ivan Kachanovsky, K-A-T-C-H-E-N-O-V-S-K-I. And he has done peer-reviewed research onto this question of who actually carried out the Maidan massacre. And uh, importantly, what he did is he used data that had itself been collected by the Ukrainian government, by the Ukrainian government after the coup and after the new government came in. So that the current governmental line lineage that led up to Zelensky, started with Poroshenko and led up to Zelensky, uh, they collected the data, but they never adequately analyzed it. And apparently, because it seemed to point to the fact that the killing of the Maidan in the Maidan massacre was actually a false flag attack carried out by supporters, by the far right supporters of the coup government. Um, so... Uh, and that actually is what precipitated uh, sort of the, 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 the final explosion of the coup. Um, it precipitated the, the fleeing of the country. It precipitated the recognition by the West of the new government. Um, and in fact, Kachanovsky actually raises the question, uh, and he has a discussion of this, whether there might actually have been some direct contacts between some Western leaders, not, not specifically the United States, he's not able to determine this, but this is based on a number of interviews with leaders of the Svoboda party, a far right party in Ukraine, who basically state that they met with Western leaders and discussed uh, what it would take to have uh, the post-coup government recognized by the, far, by the, the Western world.
and they apparently were told by the Western leaders, by the Western, the Western contact, excuse me, who was not identified, neither his nationality nor his level was identified, but they, the Svoboda leaders stated that they were told that if roughly 100 innocents died, that that would be enough to precipitate um, recognition by the Western media and by the Western powers. Uh, there was no statement in, in Kachanovsky's work that they had sp that the Western uh, contact had specifically said that they should do this. But, you know, anyone who understands how these things works would recognize that the message that those people would take away from that meeting is that if we can arrange things so that 100 people die, uh, the post-coup government will be recognized. So that's... Um, uh, that's sort of one of the dirtier undersides or one of the very difficult questions to sort out. Uh, and one of the things that uh, I don't think Kachanovsky has been able to get any deeper with other than those interviews with Svoboda party members. Um, uh, so w let me tie this together now. Um, we've talked about the role of the US in democracy promotion, which definitely contributed to the uh, uh, which contributed to the uh, the uprising. We've already talked about the connection between Victoria Newland and Jeffrey Pyatt and the phone call, which suggests that the U.S. was involved in some way in picking the people who would take over uh, after the Yanukovych regime had left. And at that time, it was not clear that the Yanukovych regime was going to leave. So we're talking about weeks in advance of the actual coup. Um, uh, and that itself is suggestive of some kind of role in the coup itself. And beyond that, I, I hesitate to speculate. Um, uh, and then finally, uh, the work of Ivan Kachinovsky suggests that the Maidan massacre, uh, which was the decisive killing of a hundred innocents uh, that had long been attributed to the uh, Yanukovych, the pre-coup government, uh, and that had was that killing that led to the widespread recognition of the post-coup government. Uh, it now appears that uh, I would say, at a minimum, most of those deaths were carried out as a false flag attack by the far right. Um, uh, that the shooting took place from government buildings that the far right had already taken over. Um, and this is based on a wide range of data that was collected by the, the post-coup, the post-Maidan Ukrainian government that involved video, audio, you know, acoustic, ballistic, autopsy, and interview data that was collected as part of trial data by the post-coup government trying to get to the bottom of the Maidan massacre but which was never properly analyzed by the post-coup government and that was not properly uh, discussed by them. And it was only with uh, the work of um, Ivan Kachanovsky uh, who accessed that information and properly analyzed it that it started to become clear uh, who had actually carried out this, this massacre. So I, I think one of the most neglected aspects of what precipitated this war is the civil war that erupted within Ukraine and the different sects within uh, the Ukrainian government. Um, so obviously, we're, we're currently dealing with right now uh, the referendums and the votes as to whether the Luhansk and Donetsk and certain regions will join uh, Russia. But but can you speak? What can be said about the conflict and the civil war that erupted uh, within Ukraine? Yeah. Uh, uh, one of the first steps that the post coup government enacted was a limitation on the use of Russian as an official language, uh, and there was other steps that were taken that were basically uh, led to activities taken against uh, culturally Russian or Russian speakers within Ukraine. Uh, many of those were centered in the Donbass area. And there basically were uh, uh, military action that has been taken place since 2014 
in which 14,000 uh, persons have been killed on the both sides, on the Ukrainian side and on the side of the uh, Ukrainians in the Donbass area, primarily Russian speakers. Uh, and then uh, uh, I hesitate to give details on this because this is a, one of the areas I would like to look into more detail. But it's certainly been claimed, and I think, uh, you know, just off the cuff plausibly, that there were Russians involved uh, on the ground there uh, that were playing some role on the uh, on the side of the Donbass uh, forces. Um, but that said, it also appears that out of the 14,000 who were killed, 10,000 were killed within the Donbass. And that there's a suggestion that most of the military action was, uh, or much of the military action anyway, was initiated by the Ukrainian side in what are referred to, what they themselves would refer to as anti terrorist activities or uh, anti terrorist uh, actions. Um, so that uh, conflict has been going on within Ukraine. Uh, very little attention or concern paid to that by the Western media, uh, that it wasn't in their interest to. Uh, uh, pay a great deal of attention to. Anyway, that's. I think that's as far as I would like to go with it. It's 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 an area I'd like to look into in much more detail, and I hesitate to say a lot more without uh, having a more informed view of it. Frankly, yeah, understandable. I I just think that the most important thing there is is that there has been a conflict within Ukraine uh, since this coup in 2014, and and uh, I think that if you don't fully understand that or if if you aren't aware of the fact that there has been a conflict and that this coup has really um caused significant strife and corruption within the Ukrainian government then then you don't really understand the context that that preceded the war so um at, at the very least I, I think that uh, uh people should be aware that a conflict has been going on within Ukraine in which Russians have largely been um the the victims of and to, I guess to move to yeah, uh, actually, let me let me add one more piece to that. Um, yeah, go ahead, uh, Liam. So, uh, uh, although the Azov Battalion, which is a far right uh, neo-fascist, fascist, neo-Nazi, whatever you want to call them, uh, certainly far right, highly nationalistic, uh, probably fascistic in orientation, uh, has been now more fully integrated into Ukrainian military you know, perhaps influencing parts of it along that with that integration. The Azov Battalion uh, in this conflict in the Donbass from 2014 forward has played a very central role and was operating oftentimes more autonomously. Um, uh, so it's very important. And they were actually being funded and uh, trained to some extent by the U.S. at an earlier stage. Uh, at certain point, the U.S. decided they would uh, no longer do that. Whether that truly put an end to it or not, I don't know. Uh, because things get passed in Congress, which there was a congressional act on this, but whether that actually was implemented on the level of practical policy or whether it continued to be armed through the CIA or who knows, uh, I don't know. Um, but yes, yeah, so these are uh, a, a lot of very important and to some extent vexed questions. Um, Absolutely. Well, um, to move on to, I guess, I think really where we need to circle around is maybe um, right before the war, what happened in December and and what led up to the meetings in December prior um, and, and the meetings between the US and Russia and and how did the negotiations fall through um, that ended up leading to uh, currently, or I guess Putin invading in February? Yeah. Yeah. Um... You know, one starting point was that uh, NATO, both within NATO and outside of NATO, there's been very active uh, uh, military activities on Russia's border. Uh, uh, it's been going on right along since 2014, especially since 20, uh, I think 2017, when Trump uh, began to provide uh, offensive uh, weapons as opposed to quote unquote defensive weapons. But in 2021, just to give a, a very striking example, which I discuss in my, my book with citation, uh, in Estonia, which is in the Baltic region, um, uh, uh, there were NATO rocket exercises. This is right on Russia's border. And these exercises took place 70 miles from Russia's border uh, with weapons 
that had a range capable of reaching uh, uh, over 100 miles into Russian territory proper. Uh, these were live fire rocket exercises, which meant they actually fired the rockets. Uh, they had dud warheads. But uh, and what these launches were designed to do was to practice destroying air defense targets inside Russia. Um, now, you can imagine how provocative that is. Uh, picture for a second, if you will, uh, Russia or China having formed a alliance and a military alliance at that with Canada <clears throat> and then establishing uh, training exercises in Canada uh, with live fire rocket exercises 70 miles from the U.S. border with rockets capable of reaching into U.S. territory. And the specific explicit purpose of those exercises was to practice destroying air defense targets inside the U.S. You can imagine the U.S. would go bonkers. I, I kind of tell that story that way to give a sense of just how uh, provocative is really the word. Uh, uh, I mean, I use certain other words like, you know, perhaps bonkers. Um, some of these activities were. Um, maybe that's uh, a bit of a harsh way to put it. But, you know, these are things that the U.S. would not have tolerated, that the U.S. would have, you know, demanded the immediate withdrawal of the, the military forces. Uh, and if those forces were not removed immediately, it's quite likely the U.S. would have launched a preemptive attack on, the, uh, on those uh, uh, launch sites. And uh, this could have led to uh, direct conflict, conf conflict between the U.S. and Russia and ultimately a, a nuclear war. Um, you know, and I would say it would not just be the military who would react this way. You can imagine, and not just Congress, you can imagine a typical American citizen uh, in anywhere in the U.S., but certainly anywhere near the northern border, uh, how they would react. These are very psychologically provocative things that have... Uh, you know, powerful effects on what responses you can anticipate, not only from the military and not only from the political leaders, but from ordinary people. Uh, and so that was a, an example of uh, the type of exercises that were considered appropriate to do in 2021. Now, also in 2021, the U.S. signed, these are bilateral, U.S.-Ukraine, these were outside of NATO, uh, at both the level of the State Department with the uh, State Department and the Ukrainian Foreign Service, and at the level of the military between the Pentagon and the uh, Defense Department within the uh, uh, Ukraine, um, uh, uh, specific treaties that were implemented starting immediately that were designed to increase the integration of US uh, and Ukraine, uh, and uh, specifically in terms of uh, military um, uh, integration. Uh, one of the explicit goals of both of those treaties at both the State Department level and at the Pentagon level was to develop and work toward NATO level military integration, even without Ukraine formally coming into NATO. And at the same time, uh, both of those treaties also referenced the 2008 Bucharest Memorandum uh, which stated that Ukraine would become a member of NATO. And they also referenced a later, I'm forgetting the actual date on this, was it 2019, 2020? They also referenced a later uh, NATO memorandum, which itself referenced the 2008 memorandum, Bucharest memorandum, that it again reasserted that, that Ukraine and Georgia will enter NATO. So at the same time that you have these extremely provocative uh, uh, military exercises with live fire on Russia's border, capable of penetrating Russian territory, on uh, practicing attacks on their defensive systems, uh, you have a set, you have a pair of treaties occurring both at the Foreign Service level and at the level of military staff with the defense departments uh, that uh, both referenced the notion that Ukraine would enter NATO and independent of that, both this, both stating that they were all committed to starting immediately working toward NATO level military inter interoperability between the US and Ukraine. So this is sort of a set of things that took place in 2021. Uh, it was in, uh, I don't recall the exact month, but certainly in uh, autumn and winter of 2021, uh, Russia began to uh, mass its forces on the Ukrainian border. 
Um, and there was a lot of question about whether this was, you know, what the intentions were. Was this simply to signal their seriousness with which they took uh, these problems, the, that they took these exercises and they took what was happening in the West uh, and they were trying to signal their resolve and trying to create pressure towards serious negotiation, which the U.S. seemed unwilling to participate in? Or was this a plan for a uh, an attack? Um, there was an article in uh, The Intercept in March this year, 2022, that referenced um, – uh, let me just see if I have a copy here. <clears throat> uh, I, I don't have it handy, but it was a re it was an article in 2022 uh, in The Intercept that was based on interviews with senior U.S. military staff uh, that stated that they determined that until the month of February, um, Putin had not decided whether or not to invade. And if anything, that supports the narrative that what Putin was trying to do was to signal resolve and to use uh, the threat of military pressure to try to force the U.S. into negotiation or to try to, uh, you know, compel the U.S. to no negotiate, etc. In any case, Russia at the same time was making statements and Putin was making statements about the dangers of what was happening um, uh, and saying that we this is really an intolerable situation for Russia. And in fact, that those kind of statements have been made at least till two th since 2008, um, when William Burns, who's the now head of um, Biden's CIA, was then ambassador to Russia, uh, wrote a memo from Moscow to the uh, Secretary of State, who was then Condoleezza Rice. It was top; se it was a secret memo that was ultimately released by WikiLeaks, uh, that basically stated that everyone in the Kremlin sees the entry of Ukraine and Georgia into NATO as an existential threat. Um, and uh, William Burns, who uh, has a, a nice literary flair, uh, put as a subject line for that memo, yet means yet, no means no. Russia's red lines, Russia's you know security red lines involving Georgia and Ukraine. Uh, so at least since 2008, it's been very clear that the idea of an armed militarized Ukraine has been seen as an existential threat by Russia. Um, uh, yet all of these activities were going on on Russia's border. Um, uh, so uh, the U Russia, Putin uh, emphasized uh, many of these ideas in uh, presentations in 2020, uh, uh, 2021. Um, and the U.S. basically refused. And actually, there's a, a, a nice statement by Anthony Blinken. Uh, I think this was in either January or very early February uh, this year, uh, where he basically says, um, uh, you know, there is no change. There will be no change uh, in NATO policy. The, the U.S., instead of uh, recognizing the idea that this idea of military expansion on Russia's border actually proposed a true security problem for Russia um, of the type that the U.S. would view as a severe security problem had it occurred on its borders. Um, the U.S. instead took the attitude that we and Ukraine have the right to bring Ukraine in and arm Ukraine uh, on Russia's border. Um, and uh, they perceived any Russian attempt to say this is unacceptable to us as a form of Russian meddling in internal Western affairs. And they would not accept it. They would they responded almost aggressively to those things because they viewed it as meddling. Uh, and it's basically none of your damn business was the mindset, I think, that, where it came from. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, these the combination, I think, of these military exercises, of these uh, bilateral treaties, uh, there were other many other military exercises that were taking place in Ukraine, both uh, U.S. and uh, multilateral, uh, many other countries involved, meaning, and near Ukraine, uh, including sea exercises. Um, the combination of that and those uh, treaties at both the, the uh, State Department and the Pentagon level that referenced the uh, uh, Bucharest Memorandum and the entry of Ukraine and Georgia, uh, and then the refusal of the U.S. to seriously contemplate any discussion that NATO would not uh, bring Ukraine in. Uh, 
and whether or not, uh, uh, and at the same time, you, you know, keep in mind the U.S. had uh, withdrawn from the uh, Intermediate Range Nuclear Weapons Treaty. Those are nuclear uh, armed missiles, land to land missiles with a range between 500 and 5,000 kilometers. Uh, the U.S. had withdrawn from that unilaterally. Uh, and uh, so I believe that the, the most uh, appropriate way to look at this and to try to piece these th things together is that this combination of military exercises, diplomatic and military alliances with Ukraine, references to the Bucharest Memorandum in the process, uh, and the steadfast and almost aggressive refusal by the U.S. to seriously discuss whether the Russians might have a legitimate security concern about the idea of NATO coming into, uh, 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 I'm sorry, the idea of um, Ukraine coming into NATO. Uh, I think that kind of combination is really what provoked the attack. Um, uh, that, uh, you know, the specific things going on in their minds uh, and any given planner, you know, which of these was the predominant influence is, is very hard to know, probably impossible to know. But I use the example in my book of a uh, of a beach castle. You know, you uh, picture a kid making a sand castle on the beach with cups or buckets of sand. And at some point, you have enough cups of sand uh, that are placed in precarious enough placements uh, and the, the castle gets high enough and awkward enough. At some point, there's going to be a collapse. And I would say, and I use this kind of terminology in the book, that the U.S. piled cups and cups of sand uh, that any clear thinking, rational, geostrategic thinker would have recognized was going to eventuate and collapse. So now just to kind of wrap it up um, and to talk about where we're at now, I'm, I'm wondering what you how you perceive the nuclear risk being that the U.S. policy seems to be to weaken Russia so that they're incapable of doing anything like this again. And with the knowledge that the U.S. or or the West has tried to interfere in any negotiations between Ukraine and Russia, um, we, we know that because of, uh, I, I believe it was a Ukrainian paper that admitted that Boris Johnson had had said that there would be no military guarantee if uh, Ukraine and, and Russia negotiated any further. So I'm wondering, with all of this knowledge and with Putin's most recent um, announcement and, and all of the referendums and, and him admitting that he will use um, nukes to defend these new territories once they're annexed, um, I'm, I'm just wondering what you think about the nuclear risk. Uh, do you, where do you think this goes? Do you have any confidence in our leaders, our Western leaders? And uh, where do you think we're at now? Yeah. Uh, you know, if you don't mind, I, I'm going to once again back up just a step and pick up on something you said that I want to address briefly before uh, trying to respond more directly to the question you just asked. Uh, you mentioned and very properly and correctly that uh, that there was uh, an article in a, a publication called the Ukrainian Pravda. Uh, this is not the Pravda truth, uh, the, the Russian Pravda from the, from the Soviet days. This is a uh, Ukrainian publication. It's actually an online publication. Uh, and they published an article in May that indicated, uh, let me go back one more step. There were active negotiations uh, facilitated by Turkey uh, between Russia and Ukraine in uh, April uh, of 2022, uh, a couple of months into the war. And it looked like tentative terms had been reached, and it was now uh, going to head towards a direct meeting between Zelensky and Putin, probably in Turkey. And what happened then was Boris Johnson, the uh, 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 British prime minister, showed up virtually without warning in Kiev and basically told uh, uh, Zelensky, and this is reported in a Ukrainian paper, uh, Ukrainian publication, not paper, it's a digital uh, venue, uh, do not make peace. Uh, and the, the paper itself or the publication itself actually says that what Boris Johnson said in essence was, you may be ready for peace, but we're not ready for peace. Uh, and we will not support it. And as you said, uh, Liam, you know, one aspect of that is that, you know, we will not provide security guarantees, which was one of the aspects of the negotiation that uh, uh, 
quite likely would have been achieved between Zelensky and Putin. Uh, it appears that the terms of that negotiation would have involved a uh, effective withdrawal from uh, by Russia to the uh, February 23rd lines that is before the invasion uh, with some adjustments made to the territory of the Donbass, uh, Donetsk and Luhansk, um, the recognition that Crimea was part of Russian territory, neutrality of Ukraine, but otherwise Ukraine remaining intact and security guarantees by other powers. I suspect the US would have been central to that. Um, uh, to secure, uh, help uh, guarantee the security of Ukraine. And these terms, which involved largely the withdrawal of Russia to the pre-invasion lines, were the, t were, were the terms of the uh, evolving engagement between Russia and Zelensky that were nixed by Boris Johnson. And it's very unlikely that Boris Johnson would have done that unilaterally without consulting with the U.S., um, further, there was just an article a few weeks ago published in the, you know, the, the important uh, influential, let's call it, Foreign Policy Journal uh, Foreign Affairs by Fiona Hill and another uh, uh, a scholar of this area that um, although Fiona Hill is extremely, uh, uh, you know, has a very strong anti-Russian stance and the article is really a very strong uh, argument portraying the, uh, you know, uh, many would perceive it as an extremely hawkish view. Uh, nonetheless, in the article, she references uh, that that she and her co-author had interviewed uh, a number of senior military officials in the U.S. Uh, who verified the account that the uh, that the that these negotiations were occurring. And when you put this together with the Ukrainian Pravda article you basically come uh, together with a fairly strongly validated account that the Western powers, certainly Boris Johnson, but quite likely with the U.S. Uh, approval, um, uh, really nixed peace uh, negotiations that would have left Ukraine substantially intact and would have given uh, Ukraine and Russia uh, uh, terms that they both probably could have lived with. Um, uh, but these were nixed. Um, you asked about the um, <clears throat> uh, the uh, uh, the nuclear threat. Uh, I think it's very concerning. Um, you know, I don't know how anyone can assess what the actual risk of nuclear war is at any time. Um, uh, certainly, this is you know being widely discussed as the most serious risk of nuclear war since the Cuban Missile Crisis. That's that's being discussed. Uh, and that's often put forward as a, almost a truism. Um, there are probably some people who think the risk is greater now because the level of contact between the U.S. and Moscow is uh, much less than it was uh, before the Cuban Missile Crisis. Before the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, President Kennedy had already established a secret backdoor channel with the Kremlin. And there were active negotiations during the Cuban Missile Crisis that occurred uh, backdoor secretly some of them carried out by uh, John F. Kennedy's brother, Robert F. Kennedy, uh, between Kennedy directly with Kennedy's brother, who was a, a extremely important player in the Kennedy administration, and the Soviet foreign minister, who was himself in direct and immediate contact uh, with the Soviet leadership. Um, so uh, one of the things that's truly frightening right now is that the level of diplomatic contact between the US and, U and uh, Russia is so low uh, until the negotiations over that uh, uh, female basketball player who was arrested on, on drug charges um, uh, and the negotiation of a prisoner release, there had been no direct contacts between Anthony Blink and the US Secretary of State and uh, the, uh, the Soviet foreign minister. Um, so, uh, and then, now it appears that there have been some contacts discussing questions of, uh, you know, trying to mitigate the risk of nuclear, a direct nuclear conflict, but the contacts are still extremely low and pitiful. There's, uh, there's been so much ill will generated and so much bad mouthing by people like Mr. Mr. Biden, you know, uh, talking about Putin as uh, I, I can't remember if he used the word terrorist, but you know, basically advocating regime change at different points. 
you know, calling uh, Putin, uh, you know, very derogatory terms, um, uh, that there's been such uh, stress and uh, such an unwillingness on the part of the U.S. I mean, the, the, the Russians have actively sought um, diplomatic level contacts, but have been, you know, have been rebuffed on that. The attitude that Anthony Blinken showed a kind of summary rejection of the idea of seriously discussing not having Ukraine join NATO. There is no, there is no change. There will be no change, period. That same intransigent attitude has characterized the uh, U.S. unwillingness to have diplomatic relations with the Russians during most of this war. And that itself is extremely troubling because I think we all know there have been many times, uh, many, there have been uh, a number of times where miscalculation, computer error, technical error have led to situations that could have led to a nuclear war between the U.S. and the Russians uh, and before that, you know, the Soviets. Um, so even if we assume for a second that there's that neither side is going to deliberately use weapons, one has to be extremely concerned about, um, you know, the greater the level of military contact between Russia and the U.S., and the lower the level of diplomatic contact, the greater the risk that some accident or miscalculation could lead to nuclear war. Now, further, uh, again, as you pointed to, Liam, uh, starting after the uh, this initially secret visit between Anthony Blinken, the Secretary of State, and Lloyd Austin, the Secretary of Defense, both of them traveled to Kiev, uh, thinking now that was in April again, uh, at that time, they announced, uh, uh, Lloyd Austin announced with Anthony Blinken at his side, that one of the U.S.'s objectives now was to weaken Russia's military to the extent that they could never carry out this kind of action again. But when you think about what it means to weaken Russian military to the extent they can never carry out an action again, you're also talking about weakening Russia's military to the extent that they can't defend themselves adequately. And this could certainly raise all the fears and concerns about uh, invasion and encroachment again on Russian territory. And the Russians have certainly uh, uh, made clear in different ways that did they feel their existence were threatened, that they would that no options would be off the table at that point. Um, further, this is not simply Mr. Putin speaking. This is Avril Haines, who's the director of national intelligence in the U.S., uh, in testimony before the Senate Armed Services Committee, stated that it is the intelligence community's uh, conviction that were Russia to conclude that their survival as a country were threatened or that Mr. Putin's regime were threatened, that nuclear weapons, the use of tactical battlefield nuclear weapons uh, might be possible. So uh, the very goal of the U.S. in trying to weaken Russia is one that the more uh, those goals are achievable, the greater the threat to Russia and the more likely it is that tactical battlefield nuclear weapons could be used. Um, and in fact, this point has been recognized actually by, uh, by military, military leaders in the U.S. So that um, uh, after the, the recent Ukrainian successes in the Northeast, uh, it, uh, some of these mil U.S. military leaders have stated that, they, that there is a real concern that especially in light of what appears to be an action that raises the possibility of greater su future success for the Ukrainian military, that we now have to be even more concerned about the possibility of escalation occurring. So that these military leaders themselves seem to be validating the idea that the US's goals of weakening Russia are themselves, if they were successful, could be extremely dangerous. And at the same time, you have uh, many in the US who are calling not just for weakening Russia, but for defeating Russia. Uh, and there you have, you know, even more so uh, an argument uh, that uh, it, what does it mean to defeat Russia? Would Russia allow itself to be defeated? Uh, I think that's an extremely dubious proposition uh, as long as they have weapons, uh, nuclear weapons, and can resort to them in extremis. Yeah, I've, I've, I've mentioned this before that um, it, it's very daunting what we're looking at right now, because instead of a, a JFK talking with a Khrushchev, we have a seemingly um, maybe demented Biden speak, not willing to speak to a Lavrov or Putin. And it's it's 
exactly the scenario we do not want, especially when it seems like Biden isn't even in control. We don't know necessarily who is making policy behind the scenes, whether it's Blinken um, or, or someone else, because I mean, how many times have we heard the White House come out and contradict something that Biden has said? So I don't know if this is strategic ambiguity times 10, or if this is just yeah. um, them intentionally trying to escalate. Um, so I'm I'm very scared about everything <laughs> that's going on right now. And uh, I, I think that your book is, is something that should be required reading for everyone who's speaking on this topic. Um, but yeah, is there, is there anything else that you wanted to cover uh, before we signed off? Yeah, well, I just want to add one more point to actually, again, building on what you said, which I think is very correct. Um, uh, and then I'll, I'll, I will add one more piece about my book. And actually, I want to mention another book that I want to recommend as well. Um, <clears throat> uh, you know, we mentioned before Victoria Newland, who uh, has played a central role in shaping policy uh, from... Uh, I'm trying to think what year she became assistant secretary of um, uh, assistant secretary of state, uh, 2013, 2012. I, any case, uh, she is has an extremely hawkish position, uh, intellectual position. Her husband is um, uh, Robert Kagan, who's a uh, sometimes thought of as an arch neoconservative ideologue, um, and uh, the interactions between uh, uh, Newland. Uh, and, uh, um, Jeffrey Pyatt. And in fact, um, uh, Biden himself was involved in uh, elements of the recognition of the new government, post-coup government. And Victoria Newland actually brought him in in order to uh, uh, help uh, stabilize the new coup government to sort of, she refers to it on her audio tape as she wants to bring Biden in to give an attaboy to, um, uh, you know, to the new regime to sort of, uh, throw his weight behind it. Um, in any case, my point here is that Victoria Newland, who then was Assistant Secretary of Defense, is now within the Biden administration at a higher position. She's Under Secretary of Defense. Um, and it may be the same Victoria Newland who was involved and in bragging about pro democracy promotion in Ukraine in 2013, who was on the phone with Jeffrey Pyatt in 2014, weeks before the actual coup, picking the winner of who would then become the prime minister, Yatsenyuk, uh, this same Victoria Newland, again, whose husband is an arch neoconservative, uh, is now the undersecretary of defense. And it appears uh, to the best I can discern at this point that Blinken is intellectually aligned with Newland and that those two are playing a crucial role in shaping policy. Uh, and then, as you mentioned, of course, um, uh, Jake Sullivan, et cetera. I, I don't have a deep pulse of the internal dynamics of the Biden administration, but the very fact that um, uh, Blinken is doing what he's doing and that uh, that there are close ties with uh, a now elevated uh, Victoria Newland is extremely suggestive of uh, a very aggressive uh, stance towards uh, toward Russia. So uh, I think I will. Uh, close I, by, uh, if you don't mind, I will just mention my book one more time, How the West Brought War to Ukraine. I definitely recommend it. It's a short read. Uh, and I think it provides a lot of background and ties together a lot of uh, facts that are hard to keep straight otherwise. Uh, but I, what I really wanted to say at this point was I want to mention this book here. Boy, I, I, uh, <clears throat> uh, I'm going to just give me one second, everybody. I want to just see if I can... Um, uh, reverse my screen. It comes up if... correctly for me. Um, oh, is it really? Yeah. Uh, yeah. How about now? Is it reversed now or it's uh, coming up correct? It's, it's, it's up correct right? for me. Okay, good. All right. Uh, for some reason, I was getting it backwards. Any case, this is a book called War with Russia, question mark, by Stephen F. Cohn. Stephen F. Cohn is uh, sadly no longer alive. He died of cancer in 19, at age 81, I think in 2020. Um, Stephen Cohn was really one of the, the one of the very preeminent scholars of uh, Russia in the United States. He has a deep, deep academic background. Is um, professor was professor emeritus at both NYU, New York University, and at Princeton. Uh, he's by no means sort of uh, uh, you know a blind dove. In the 1970s, uh, I believe he was a graduate student at that time. 
he was actually smuggling copies of Solzhenitsyn's writing into the Soviet Union. And you can imagine what kind of risk that would entail. In any case, uh, um, uh, Stephen F. Cohn has put together this book called War with Russia, which is basically a compilation of short little writings. Many of them were actually published in the Progressive Nation magazine. His wife, um, uh, Katrina Vandenhoeven, it was actually a, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, editor-in-chief of that uh, publication. And as you can imagine, since most progressives have been kind of doubling down on this war, uh, that created some stress within the uh, bureaucracy of the nation magazine. But this is a wonderful book. I'd really want to recommend it because there's so much of what's going on now that presumes this kind of evil, evil character of Hitler, uh, of, of Putin as a Hitler-like character. And there's so much nonsense that has been said about him. And this book really can set the record straight. Um, uh, Stephen F. Cohen has had deep contacts with um, Russia, ha deep hands-on contacts since the 70s. Um, and it's an excellent book, very short, very, uh, not the book itself is not super short, but the, the readings are very short. There's an excellent uh, audible reading, which is actually how I first digested it. Um, and I just, I, I feel like there's, it's a marvelous pairing of that book with my book. Uh, my book, by the way, it sells for $10. The ebook just came out. Amazon only allows you to sell ebooks at a minimum price of 99 cents. And I priced mine at that price because I really wanted to make it very accessible. Uh, and I actually have an audible book in production, which is coming out quite soon uh, with a very uh, reader that I like very much. So uh, that uh, audible of my book should be coming out in um uh, in, uh, let's see, we're now at the end of September. I hope it'll be out by the middle of October. Um, so the pairing of these two books, I think is really a nice pairing. If you want to sort of fairly quick, safe, enjoyable way to, uh, safe, uh, safe in terms of getting, I think, solid material, uh, to go deeper in your understanding. And really, even if you don't read the whole war to Russia, it's a couple hundred pages, um, I think if you end up listening to, let's say, 10 of the short little things, which probably comprise about 50 pages of the book, you can painlessly get that uh, if you happen to be a person who uh, listens to Audible while you're riding your bicycle or something or exercising. You know, you can do that in a couple of hours. And uh, I think in a, a whole deeper perspective on to some of the human dimensions of Putin and also to uh, some of the internal uh, bureaucratic struggles that go on within the Kremlin. Very often, Putin is described as a sort of uh, complete individual autocrat who has freedom of action to act in a kind of Stalin-esque character, uh, and uh, this is uh, not accurate. Uh, um, and that's one of the virtues of Stephen Cohn's writing is he makes clear the constraints within which uh, Putin has been operating. Great. So, um, yeah. Well, well, I'll link to both of those books. I'll, I'll put the description. Um or I'll, I'll link to the books in the description so people can buy your book in uh, war, war with Russia. Um, yeah. And as soon as the Audible comes out too, I'll, I'll link that there. Um, I will just say like, just to emphasize to the audience how important this topic is. Um, I mean, it really does seem like the, the Biden doctrine for whatever reason seems to be to escalate wherever possible all at once um, with Iran, with China, with Russia. And we are getting into a situation where um, nuclear war is likely and it's crazy to say um but i mean i'm i'm 22 and you know i i heard stories of uh the soviet union and the cold war and all of the the nuclear drills that people had to do and all the scare tactics but now like we're we're really here and me living in montana um, montana is considered a, a nuclear sponge with all of their minutemen here um, so it's a it's a very daunting thing, and I think everyone should educate themselves and go out and buy Benjamin's book. Um, I did. I, I gave it a read. It's seventy pages, very short, but packed full of information. Um, so I'll be sure to link that book into the description so people can go get it either in physical form or the ebook. Um, and then, is there like anywhere else that people can find you? I know you had mentioned that you wrote the article for Medium, um, but are you on social media and other things like that? Uh, no, I'm not really on social media. Um, people can find me. Uh, I mean, I, I'll give you an email address right now. I have it in the back of the book. Uh, I have a little about the author paragraph. And at the end of that, I give an email address, which is uh, b.abelow, A-B-E-L-O-W, dot 2022 
at gmail.com, b.abelo, A-B-E-L-O-W, dot 2022 at gmail.com. And if you, you know, if you want to write, uh, feel free. I'm getting a little bit inundated with a, a request to speak, but to my understanding, this is the only book of this type out right now. Uh, so I, I may or may not be able to respond in depth, but I'll certainly read everything I get and I'll, I, I'll certainly uh, respond at least briefly. And in some cases I can respond in depth. So, you know, I would say feel free to write if, if you have a particular reason to. All right. Well, thank you so much for taking your time to come on the show and working with me. Um, I know you had a lot of patience just trying to find uh, time to uh, get on well, here and, and people, you have a, there's a lot of demand for you now. You, you've been on a lot of shows, so I, I would recommend everyone go listen to um, those podcasts too. Yeah. Well, great. Well, I, I also want to say thank you, Liam. And uh, even though you're, you're now like the fourth podcast that I've done and uh, I've got a bunch more of things lined up, uh, both podcasts and with some uh, kind of more uh, certain types of media, um, you were the first person to contact me. And uh, so in some sense, you were, you were the uh, the person who introduced me to this world, even though we, it was ultimately belated uh, and delayed. So thank you. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm glad uh, we made it happen. And I'm sure I'm going to have to have you back on as um, things develop. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Bye. Thank you.